Good evening and welcome to the school committee uh, meeting of Monday, August 3rd, 2020. The meeting is being held uh, by way of a Zoom teleconference. Public comment may be submitted prior to the meeting and throughout the meeting to L. Howard, L H O W A R D at winthrop.k12.ma.us. Any public comment received uh, this evening will be read during our, our scheduled meeting. Uh, Patty, can you please call the roll call? Yes, Ms. Barry? Here. Mr. Boncori? Here. Mr. Capabianco? Here. Mr. Matucci? Here. Ms. Swope? Ms. Wolf? Here, Susan. Okay. Ms. Powell? Present. Mr. Perrin? Present. This meeting will be recorded and may be televised live. Uh, Mr. Capabianco, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? And Mr. Boncori, can you provide us with the flag again? Oh, yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag. The United of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the to Republic. The Republic. Which, which stands, stands one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Okay, public comment this evening. I believe we received a large amount of emails. Um, Ms. Hames, will you please uh, begin to read those? Yes. We have public comment received uh, by Todd Sacco on Friday, July 31st. Winthrop School Committee, I am writing to you today to express my deep concern about your upcoming vote on Monday night regarding the back to school recommendation. I am very concerned about the union's position and even more concerned you will be in alignment with them. Remote learning is not in the best interest of kids. The Academy, the American Academy of Pediatricians, WHO, CDC, and countless other medical experts are not on the side of remote learning not to mention the economic damage this will do to our community. I implore you to open the schools full-time and if not full-time, part-time remote learning. Keep in mind parents can opt to have their kids use the online state program, which will remove funding from the district. This would be devastating depending on the number of kids who do this to our budget. You are in the unique position to save our community. Please do the right thing. Public comment <clears throat> received from Richard Roy on Saturday, August 1st. Dear Superintendent Howard, I am the grandparent of a child entering the third grade this year. And as most of us are very concerned about the difficult choices and recommendations you will be making for the continuation of her education. My granddaughter's teacher was out for most of the second grade. And although the substitute did an admirable job, she was nonetheless second string. When schools closed, there was very little teaching. Our teachers went from being in front of the classroom to being in front of a computer to conduct online instruction, something they had no training in or experience with. In essence, my granddaughter lost half a year of her education. This upcoming school year will be very challenging for all involved. I suspect that the mechanics of keeping the schools clean and as safe as possible have been addressed. Even if your decision is to open the schools fully, I believe that there will be a number of parents that will find that option to be too dangerous. And there is a very real possibility that a second wave of this virus will force the schools to close. We will need online learning. Through no fault of anyone, we failed our kids when schools closed this year. We cannot fail again. What instruction and tools have been provided thus far to our teachers so that, can, so that they can remotely educate their students? What ongoing support is available for the teachers and how are they to be monitored and evaluated? Are you confident that enough has been done? What plans are in place to educate those parents and other caregivers to our roles in this new world? Have we surveyed parents to ensure that households have internet access and computers? What can be done for those households that do not have internet access? What additional support will be available to parents? My granddaughter is fortunate that she has caring, responsible and educated parents who will find this new world a challenge. They are not educators and it will be difficult, but they will rise to the challenge. Unfortunately, there are kids that do not have these advantages and this will put additional strain on the educators. I do not envy the very difficult position you are in. Your decisions and actions today will affect all the children of the town for the rest of their lives. Regards, Richard Roy. <clears throat> the next uh, email 
is from Crystal and Brian DeMeo on Sunday, August 2nd. Dear members of the school committee, I hope you had a nice weekend and enjoyed the weather. My husband and I wanted to reach out to express our thoughts and concerns around the decision to reopen schools. We feel strongly that schools should be open, at least partially. While we understand the safety concerns for reopening in full, it is definitely beneficial for students and families to be given the option of at least a hybrid model. In-person schooling not only provides academic instruction, but supports the development of social emotional learning, which during times like these is just as model. In-person schooling not only provides academic instruction, but supports the development of social emotional learning. Oh, I'm sorry, which during times like this is just as important for children <coughs> academics. With schools being closed since March, academic progress has definitely slowed down or in some cases stopped altogether. We were fortunate enough to have been able to maintain working our full-time jobs and tackle home learning, but it was not comparable to our children being in a classroom setting. <clears throat> our fifth grade son who always did math with ease began to struggle and we watched him fall apart as he couldn't grasp this new way of learning online. Our sixth grade daughter was thriving in her first year of middle school, is very much a hands-on learner and needs in-person academics to keep her motivated. We could go on and on with a list of reasons why we believe using an in-person model is best, but instead the statement taken from an article by the CDC sums it up. In short, social interactions that facilitate the development of critical social and emotional skills are greatly curtailed or limited when students are not physically in school. In an in-person school environment, children more easily learn how to develop and maintain friendships, how to behave in groups, and how to interact and form relationships with people outside of their family. In school, students are also able to access support systems needed to recognize and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, appreciate others' perspectives, and make responsible decisions. Thank you for, for your time, Crystal and Brian DeMeo. Uh, next is from Jennifer Dykins on Sunday, August 2nd. Um, I reached out to Kristen Reynolds regarding my concerns about in-person teaching this coming school year, and she suggested I reach out to you in hopes that you could put me in touch with the HR agency that will be working with our staff. I would love more than anything to return to school in September and start 2020 school year as I normally would, but I do not think this is realistic this year. Until it is 100% safe, I feel as though we should be spending our time developing and implementing a more robust distance learning program for our students. I look forward to tomorrow's staff meeting and hearing what your thoughts are. I truly thank you for your constant support, Jen Dykins. Uh, the next is from Connie Grayson on Sunday, August 2nd. I am writing this letter on behalf Daddy, of the- Can yes. I just interrupt you for a second? Um, hmm. Connie's, Connie's letter has been uh, asked not to be read. Okay. Apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is from Sandra and Jamie Aristi on Monday, August 3rd. Dear Ms. Howard, my husband and I wanted to write to you in advance of today's school committee meeting to our concerns about opening schools. For a variety of reasons, we will not be sending Hazel fourth grade to school this year, and we are aware of a large cohort of parents that feel the same. We also know that you do, we also know that to do so can mean less money for the schools should we ha not have an online option since we will have to withdraw completely to homeschool our child. Please do not open the schools this fall. Give this virus a chance to die out and keep all of our teachers, administrators, and students safe. No one should have to die as a result of getting an education. That was from Son Sandra and Jamie Aristi. The next one is from John McAvoy on Monday, August 3rd. Dear Superintendent Howard, I am concerned about the in-person reopening of schools in September, even in hybrid format. I have real difficulty seeing how it will function in a learning-centric environment while keeping all students and staff safe. I am the father of twin boys moving into the third grade and my eldest moving into fifth. My wife is an educator. My entire family is at risk of exposure should there be an outbreak in the school system. To equate this to an adult work situation, this scenario would be like would be like being required to attend regular all day in person meetings in a small room with 10 to 12 other people that I do not know, I can trust, have been following any of the appropriate safety steps. So 
I would have very little way of knowing if I am protected. Within this meeting, you are required to sit in your seat and face forward for hours, including to eat lunch. There is no getting up from the chair the whole time, no matter how uncomfortable. I can pretty much guarantee that not one participant in that meeting is really taking anything on board after the first hour. Plus, during lunchtime, everyone has to remove their masks and at the same time to eat, which pretty much nullifies a lot of the point of wearing a mask the previous three hours, since we would all be breathing the circulated air. Maybe occasionally meeting participants have to get up to use the bathroom and there are a bunch of similar meetings going in the same building. The bathroom is small, so traffic in and out has to be monitored or you end up with lots of meeting participants mixing in very close proximity. I'm going to hope they all make the right choice and wash their hands. Then you have all those folks touching door handles, et cetera. <clears throat> it's 85 degrees outside. The meeting has been going on for three hours, all wearing masks. The seat is uncomfortable folks getting re re restless and faces are sweaty. So one person takes their mask off, but the person running the meeting who is in a simil similar situation has to keep telling folks to put the mask back on, but that person doesn't really believe in wearing masks anyway. So the person running the meeting gets aggravated, stressed, and the person continues to refuse to wear the mask. So the meeting host tells the person to leave the room. Where do they go? Do they stand in the hallway without the mask on? In my work life, this is probably a meeting that I would decide to skip and cite OSHA concerns, telling my boss I will dial into the meeting instead. The tech company I work for in Boston cannot navigate all these challenges with adults and has told us to work from home until January. And this is a couple hundred adults that I, for the most part, know very well. How can we expect this from our kids? I can't keep my kids, even when doing something really fun, in the same spot from from more than maybe 30 minutes. How can teachers be expected to manage kids under such restrictions and keep everyone in the room safe, including themselves, while managing all behaviors, academic and health precautions, <laughs> learning past the first 45 minutes? Sitting still just seems entirely unrealistic, even for me as an adult. You are asking teachers to enforce wearing masks when not everyone believes they are effective. So there will be teachers put at risk while enforcing such requirements. I do not think that kids will engage in meaningful learning while under COVID protocols. Teachers are put at increased risk and it seems to be stacked like a house of cards to pursue the in-person route. Just look at the state, just look at the start to the professional baseball season and how that has not gone particularly well one weekend. Plus, when outbreaks do occur, I'm sure that substitute teachers will not be easy to come by if an educator has to quarantine for two weeks, specifically as I know there are families planning to hire these teachers privately and share the cost among two or three households. I am not convinced that our children will learn in person while being guaranteed safety. I appreciate your attention to my concerns around in-person learning. I also want to acknowledge that you have so many interests to balance and this by no means and this is by no means an easy task at all. So thank you for all that you and the staff are doing during this difficult time. Sincerely, John McAvoy. Okay, we have two more. This is Kristen Bonapane, Monday, August 3rd. As the parents of three children in the Winthrop Public School System, we are writing to you to express our support for the hybrid model of learning when school reopens in September. With the safety measures proposed, we are comfortable allowing our children to resume in-person learning on a part-time basis. We feel strongly that schools should be partially reopened, affording students the opportunity for the combination of in-person and remote learning. Over the past several months, like many other parents and caregivers, we have experienced the challenges of remote learning with our middle and high school age children. We have witnessed the negative effects and are deeply concerned that continued and prolonged remote learning will have a lasting detrimental impact academically, socially, and emotionally. The hybrid model will provide students the opportunity for critical in-person academic instruction, as well as much needed peer interaction while adhering to the established CDC guidelines to reduce the spread of infection. We urge you to please consider the potential repercussions that 170 additional days of remote learning will have on the overall well-being of the children who attend Winthrop Public Schools. While we understand there will be associated risks and the need to transition back to full remote learning will ever, will ever present given the 
fluidity of the COVID-19 pandemic, we feel that families should be given the opportunity to choose a physical return to the classroom that benefits the, for the students will be far reaching. Please help our students return to their classrooms. We are confident that our community, administrators, teachers, school staff, and families can work together and do this safely. Uh, Kristen and Stephen Bonapani. And the last uh, public comment we have is Danielle Reardon, um, August 3rd. I am writing this email with concerns relating to the upcoming, upcoming 2021 school year reopening plan. I am the mother of two middle school children who will be entering seventh and eighth grade this September. It is my belief that students be allowed to return to a hybrid model of instruction. I am well informed of the potential risks associated with the decision to send our children back into the classroom, but I strongly believe that returning to the classroom, at least in partial form, is truly in the best interests of our children, their academics, and their social and emotional well being. Prior to March 2020, my then seventh grade son was actively engaged in all his academic classes. He even developed a love for music class. I watched him grow as a young man and gain independence while developing strong interpersonal skills with his teachers and classmates. I watched my daughter who had always struggled a bit in school truly flourish in her first year of middle school. Her confidence in her academic abilities made her so proud and her ability self-advocate was a skill that can only be learned by interacting with others in a social setting. Unfortunately, once remote learning began, I have also watched both of my children suffer from not only the academic loss, but also the motivational and organi organizational skills that are provided with an in-school learning model. I have witnessed the changes in them from a forced isolation and lack of social socialization with their peers. I am fearful of the impact that further isol isolation and continued remote learning will have on them. I urge you, please allow, please allow our children to return to partial in-classroom learning. I am confident that the Winthrop Public school system will do what is right for <coughs> children while following CDC guidelines to reduce the spread of infection. And that is from uh, Danielle Spinali Redden. And that's all I have at this moment. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hames. We appreciate you reading those. Uh, we will be checking uh, for further public comment as we move further into the meeting. Uh, the next thing up is uh, delegates and visitors, which I assume we have none. That's and correct. Moving on to the minutes. Uh, we have the minutes of July 13, 2020 meeting. Can I get a motion to accept the minutes of a July 13, 2020 meeting? A motion. Motion. motion second. Uh, so who, who's the second on that? I oh, second it. Phil. Phil. Mr. Boncori. Any discussion? Patty, can I have a roll call, please, for the record? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Ms. Can hear you. Uh, yes, on mine as well. Okay. Okay. Moving on to financial uh, procedures, we have warrant SVW twenty one dash one in the amount of one hundred ninety one thousand nine hundred twenty two dollars and fifty seven cents. Can I get a motion for warrant number SVW twenty one in the amount of in that amount? Motion. Do we have Check. a motion? Mr. Capabianco, is that a motion? It's a motion. Yeah. Second by Jeff Powell. Ms. Powell. Any discussion on the warrant? Hearing none, Patty, can we get a roll call vote, please, for the record? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Can I get a... Uh, we have a payroll warrant. We actually have two SPW 21 dash 01 in the amount of $138,828 and 47 cents and SPW 21 dash 02 in the amount of $161,370 and 93 cents. Can I get a motion to take them both together, please? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Mr. Capianco, second by Ms. Swope. 
Any discussion? Hearing none. Patty, can we get a roll call vote, please? Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Stay. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Abstain. Okay, we also have a, a budget transfer in the amount of $130,342.60. Can I get a motion on that budget transfer, please? Motion. Motion by Mr. Matucci. Can I get a second, please? Second. Second by, who was the second by? Ms. Barry. Yes. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Patty, can I have a roll call vote for the record, please? Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Okay, we're moving on to buildings and grounds. There is none this evening. Moving on to general functions, reports. We have a subcommittee meeting for the policy subcommittee. Ms. Powell, can you please bring us through that meeting? Yes, uh, the first meeting that we had was to discuss the naming policy. And in that um, discussion, we looked at the, we currently have a moratorium on naming. And we looked at what we would be doing going forward. The moratorium was put into place as the new school was coming onto line. And the expectation was that we would then again, review the policy go, to, to decide what we wanted to do going forward. We discussed the academic value of naming buildings and the challenges that there are around who you name and how those decisions are made, as well as continuing to honor the existing names that we have. So we have different facilities that have been named after different people. And when you start to then name underneath that, you start to dilute the value of the honoring that we're doing. So we have put forward a motion to, um, to moving forward, not be in the business of naming at all. So under that, under that motion or under that proposal, we would be, the school committee would not be accepting nominations for namings of any of our facilities, but we would continue to honor the facilities that we have in existence. Thank you. Do we need a vote on that, Ms. Powell? Um, the vote from the subcommittee was unanimous and we need to have a, um, we need to have a vote of the full committee. So, and I don't know, Patty was the, I couldn't, uh, uh, I, I'll read to you what I have and I, I'll, I'll actually put forth the motion. Um, Whereas the major facilities will be, and to preserve the honor that without delusion, the Winthrop School Committee will not consider nominations for naming of additional facilities. Second. Second by Mr. Matucci. Any discussion? I just feel we probably shouldn't give up that right in case there was an extenuating circumstance where we wanted to do something. I think that, to be honest with you, that the moratorium has, has kind of kept it uh, down to a very uh, low, a minimum amount of requests, but we can always go back and revisit this should there be a, a situation where it's warranted, where we think that someone should be, you know, that a building or a facility should be named after someone. So we can reopen it. So this, this doesn't preclude us from, from changing it next week, if that's what we decide to do, if someone has the qualifications that, that fall under our previous policy, we can actually set the standard. Uh, at that time. So any further discussion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call vote please, Patty, for the record? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Bianco? No. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Okay, moving on to the superintendent's report. Ms. Howard. Thank you. No, Thank no, you. Brian, Brian, we've got another subcommittee. Yeah, there's another policy. Oh, I'm it's sorry. I, I apologize. I didn't see that on the agenda. Got to make sure we get this done, yep. Yeah, that's okay. So this is a policy that enables our next steps with the school, um, opening up, moving forward. It would be regarding masks. 
Um, and in, in summary, students would be required to wear masks or students and staff, anybody who comes into the schools would be required to wear masks so long as the state still has that requirement in place. We, the, re, the way that it is written, it would automatically um, be, it would automatically be removed once the state's guidelines have changed, but it would also be something that the, that the board can revisit at any point and make a, make a change. So I'll put forward that motion so we can have a discussion on it. The motion is, um, and this was approved unanimously by our committee. Mask uh, Winthrop Public Schools will require students in pre-K through grade 12 students attending in-person learning and school sponsored events and activities to wear masks that cover their nose and mouth. This policy will remain in place as long as the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education requires mask wearing in schools. Exceptions will be granted for health reasons and reflective of the guidance from the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. All exceptions must be approved by the superintendent and the school building principal. Second. Second by Mr. Matucci. Any further discussion? Hearing none, can I get a roll call? I, let, me just, let me just ask, in reading this, um, and I guess this is a question to the chair, to Mrs. Howard, do we need to add in, this is addressing the students, do we need to add in staff and school visitors yeah. to schools? So for clarity purposes, you, you could, um, but in terms of visitors to schools, uh, within the larger return to school plan, there's a, a, um, a procedure for visitors to the school um, and visitors will be uh, limited, extremely limited uh, during, during the process. But if you want to add it for clarity, um, I think it, it could make sense to do so. So are you amending your motion, Ms. Powell, to add uh, faculty and staff as well? Yes. Or you're saying all persons? All persons. On premises, yeah. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question on this issue? What if a child has a, a, a breathing condition or a doctor's note? Because I'm, I think everyone should that's, wear a mask. But what do we do? That's, 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 that's in there. That's in there. That, that is in the uh, motion as well. It, 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 there are provisions for that in the policy. My preference is I think that student should probably. I hate to say it, but not be in a classroom with other kids with a mask. So there is just for the purpose through the chair, um, if I may, just for the purpose of clarity. Um, the guidelines and protocols that have been provided by the Department of Education in their uh, workings with CDC and, and the folks at uh, the various hospitals in Boston, they have provided school districts with um, protocols and procedures in, in order to address those uh, very specific issues. And that will be part of the reopening plan as well. Okay, that's for all staff. So I just want to clarify. All staff and students and yes. visitors. Um, to, uh, uh, can I get a second on my amendment and then I can go to the discussion? I think okay. Mr. Matucci already seconded. Um, and, and through the chair, there, the other reason that we need to adopt this is because we want to be more strict than the state. The state has asked for grades two and up, and we are asking pre-K and K because we feel that that is, um, from a safety standpoint, we feel it is important to have those grades covered. And so in order for us to require that, we need to actually have a policy in place. Excellent. Uh, okay. So I think we first need to vote on the amendment. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, voting on the amended motion. Ms. Uh, Hames, could you please call the roll? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Okay, moving on, I believe that's it for the uh, subcommittee for policy, uh, superintendent's report. Um, yes, um, Mr. Perrin, I would like to do my uh, superintendent report will be incorporated in uh, the return to school recommendations that are under new business so if I would like to move my, my report down to new business. Excellent. So personnel, do we have any appointments, resignations, retirements, postings, leaves of absence? Yes, we have one, um, two resignations. Christina Boshin, an ELL teacher at the William P. Gorman School, and Melissa Moore, an ELL teacher at the Arthur T. Cummings School. We have no appointments or retirements for this meeting. 
We have the posting of the ELL teachers, uh, and we also have a posting for additional nurses uh, for, to help accommodate our plan. And we have no um, leave of absences at this point. Okay. Um, I guess we're coming into new business, uh, re return to school recommendation. Uh, I think that's where you left off for your report. Yes, thank you. And I have um, Laurie Gallivan is our executive director of curriculum instruction and accountability. And Laurie is going to um, host a slideshow for you to see, which will, um, I believe she is gonna share her screen now to do so. And just let me check with her. Laurie, are you set to do that? Yes, doing it now. Thank you. So thank you um, to everybody for this opportunity uh, this evening. I had forwarded um, some additional material to the committee um, and I had taken that material and condensed it down to uh, a short PowerPoint that hopefully would be understandable to the community uh, as well as the committee. So to open, um, the Department of Education has charged all public schools with reviewing three scenarios to determine how we will educate our students in the fall. They require the school committee to approve a scenario that will meet the needs of our students in a manner that provides opportunity for in-person learning unless there is evidence to support our inability to do so. The department has provided us with guiding principles related to safety, health and well-being, and teaching and learning to guide our direction and inform our decision making. We have taken this task on very seriously with a great deal of effort to determine a plan for the reopening of schools. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts of countless hours of time that have gone into this process and the development of a recommended plan to open our schools. I would like to thank the multiple members of our school staff and community who have generously offered to participate in this complex and more than challenging process. The dedication to problem solving, creative thinking, reliance on data provided by the Department of Education, the CDC, and the medical community, the group's acknowledgement of equitable practice and willingness to be open to all possibilities during this time of uncertainty and changing information has been nothing short of amazing. While we are all feeling a range of emotions from fear to worry to hope and excitement, we do however understand that the Department of Education expects schools to reopen in the fall with a plan that reflects educating as many students as possible in in-person learning unless there is justification not to do so. There are three options that the uh, um, three options of education that we are charged to consider with the opening, and they are as follows. Full in-person learning which, with the new safety requirements, a hybrid learning model, which is a combination of in-person and remote learning, and a full remote learning model, which is students learning from home, similar to how we learn in the spring, but with a more robust uh, plan. There are also models, uh, these are the models that the Return to School Task Force has considered for our return in the fall. Next slide, please. The, the model, full in-person model, would return 100% of students and staff to the winter public schools, inclusive of all the new safety protocols and requirements outlined by the Department of Education. Although our schools can physically accommodate all students back in classrooms using the minimum three foot distancing guidelines. And if all students pre-K to 12 were wearing masks, there are factors and impacts that do not support this plan. A significant number of administrators, staff, the Board of Health and parents have voiced concerns that these distancing measures are less than ideal. This concern coupled with a number, the number of challenges that would come with managing large numbers of students in such a restrictive environment, the significant loss of structured learning time due to student management during times like entrance and dismissal, meal times, hallway passing, 
recess, all of those things have caused us to take a more cautious and deliberate approach to reopening of our schools. The next model that is up for consideration by the committee is the hybrid learning model. School districts throughout the Commonwealth are considering different types of hybrid learning. In the hybrid learning model, cohorts of students alternate between in-person and remote learning. And they are grouped into smaller cohorts attending school in a number of ways, such as a one week on and a one week off schedule. Number two would be a two to, two to three day per week in-person learning model where you would be in person two days and perhaps home on the other three learning remotely and another type of hybrid learning such as a half day model where students would split the day some students coming in the morning and some students coming in the afternoon while there are pros and cons to each one of these options all that have been looked at by our return to school task force if we were to go with this model option two would best fit the needs of our students in terms of our ability to follow the safety, safety and cleaning protocols necessary to open schools and keep our students safe. In option two, students in grades pre-K through 12 would attend school two days per week and learn remotely for the remaining three days. Identified high need student groups would potentially attend days, uh, school four days per week. All of our students would be divided into a specific cohort and in our case, a blue cohort and a gold cohort. We would prioritize placing families in the same cohort on the same schedule unless otherwise requested. The third type of model we needed to consider was a full remote learning similar to that that we were in at the end of the school year. Our new remote learning plan would include the following requirements per, the, uh, per, per Department of Education regulations. One, specific school-based procedures listed in the individual school plan for all students to participate in remote learning using uh, use of our iPad system, Google Documents, Schoology, and a multitude of other online platforms at various grade levels. We would be tracking attendance and participation. The second aspect of this, the continuous use of professional development time for educators to assume to assure that academics are aligned to the state standard standards and that student assessment was informing and continuing to inform our instruction. The third would be that grades and or standards based reports would be completed for all students during remote work, their remote academic work time. And number four, each building would have their own coordinated plans for teachers and administrators to regularly communicate with parents and guardians. We can hold on that uh, slide for a minute. The return to school process that we have gone through has been intense. As I explained at the beginning of the presentation, multiple people uh, from in-school people to parents, to community members, to administration, uh, sifted through the Department of Education guidance and outlines that they had provided us as the must do's in any one of the above situations. Although our schools can bring students back into classrooms, Using the three foot distancing with masks pre-K to 12, as I stated before, a, sig a significant number of folks weighed in on that, including our staff, the Board of Health and parents, and agreed that this measure was less than ideal. But that concern again, coupled with the management of those large numbers has caused us to take a more deliberate thought process and we are not recommending that a full in-person learning model be the way we go for the fall. You can switch to the next slide. In developing a hybrid model plan with all the health and safety standards required by the Department of Education, if we could switch just to the next. Um, yeah, Lisa, did you want to show the video? Oh, um, it's on this slide. Well, let, me, let me read the hybrid model plan and then we can go to the video. Okay. In developing a hybrid model plan with all of the health and safety standards required by the Department of Education, we believe that we can implement the hybrid plan model. It allows us to do several things. Number one, it allows us to begin the process of a phased in 
return to in-person learning for our students and staff. Number two, this hybrid plan is driven by the recommendations from state officials and the well-respected health and infectious disease specialists in the state. Number three, it meets and in many areas exceeds the health and safety regulations and guidance related to things such as PPE, personal protective equipment, mask wearing, social distancing, feet, as, as I stated, the, the floor was three feet and we believe six feet is the appropriate uh, distance, six feet or more. Very specific hand washing and hygiene protocols and cleaning and sanitization schedules and protocols. And number four, this particular type of hybrid plan provides alternatives for those who cannot return to a model of in-person learning. This type of model would be reflective of one that implements all of the new safety practices, ensures social distancing, and provides opportunity for in-person teaching and learning in smaller groups, and also provides staff and families with the training and support necessary to keep our community safe. I'd like to share a video with you now that was provided to us by the Department of Education. The Department of Education, as I had said uh, earlier on, provided us with multiple levels of guidance and, and guiding documents, as well as procedural manuals and processes to open our schools. And one would wanna know how they would have all of that information and where they would get that from. This video shares the collaborative efforts that the Department of Education had with the health community of the state of Massachusetts. It's about two minutes long, um, but it is certainly worth watching uh, before we move on. So Laurie, if you can pull that up. Is it going to give us volume, Larry? Volume. I'm checking to see why the volume is not playing. That's all. Hold on one second. And of course, we've tested this multiple times. And it I know, worked all day today. What happened? Okay, here it is. I got it. I got it. Let me go backwards. How's that? at how things are going related to COVID-19 in the state of Massachusetts, we actually have a lot to be optimistic about. We've done a phenomenal job of getting our rates of transmission down. We are viewed around the country as a leader in developing strategies to reduce the spread of infection. Getting our kids back to school is really only safe because we've gotten the rates of transmission down to a low level, low and, and continuing to, to drop. If we were in another state, we'd be having a different conversation. There will be important measures that are going to be implemented at each individual school to make sure that kids stay safe, kids and teachers. One of them will be social distancing. We're going to keep kids apart. We're going to rely heavily on the use of masks, which we know are highly effective at reducing transmission. We're going to rely on hand hygiene. We're going to really in, in require children to be washing their hands or using hand sanitizer frequently over the course of the school day. So one of the most important things that parents and families can do to support safe return to school is ensuring that they're only sending their children to school when they're well. Every day, we want parents to ensure that their children don't have any symptoms that could be a sign of COVID. We know that classrooms are going to look different than they did last year. They're going to be configured in a way that's going to maximize the safety to both students and to teachers. The first difference that will be noticed is that the desks are going to be spaced further apart. We know that not every classroom will be able to achieve six feet of distancing, and that's safe provided that children who are in those classes, as well as the teachers, are wearing their mask. 
In addition, they're all going to be facing forward because we know that sideways transmission is rare. And with those strategies in place, distances shorter than six feet can still be done safely. So because of what we've learned about the virus itself, we feel comfortable that the plans that have been outlined are a safe and effective way for our children to return to school this fall. I'm an infectious disease physician, but I'm also a mom, and there is nothing more important to me than the safety of my kids. I really believe that we're putting together strategies that are going to protect our kids and the educators in the classroom to make it safe for them to go back to school. My children are going to be going back to school in the fall, and I am really confident that they're going to be fine. The Department of Education had provided us with that video uh, and did ask us to share that with our school committees and with uh, families. We will post the video uh, to our website as well uh, so that folks can look at that um, and, and maybe be able to hear it better uh, if it wasn't coming through as, as well as we would have liked it to have come. So back to um, what the recommendation of the return to school task force is to the school committee. Um, it is recommended that we start the 2021 school year in a hybrid model to allow a phased in approach to returning all of our students to back, back to school. If the metrics in the state and Winthrop remain positive and medical science and future guidance supports it, we recommend the school committee reevaluate the viability of returning all students into uh, to in-person learning on a schedule that will be determined by the committee and myself and mirroring uh, the phased in approach uh, that is working uh, in, our, in our state now. There will be in this model uh, an option for families to opt out of the recommended plan, to opt out of the hybrid learning plan and so select a full remote model. Families who select to opt out will be given the opportunity to participate in an online remote program offered by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education at the district's expense. That will be monitored, this, this particular opt, uh, opt out remote learning program will be different than the remote learning that we ran in the fall and would be different than the remote learning that we would have to implement if in fact the school district was closed uh, either by the state or uh, for a surge in the community. In this type of a model, because it's offered by the state of Massachusetts, those families who would participate in that uh, model while we were running our hybrid model, the school district does not lose its chapter 70 allocation for those students because those students are still technically enrolled in the public school. However, the public school is funding an option for them to remain fully remote. We're awaiting more guidance from the Department of Education on the specifics of that plan. Uh, and it is a little bit frustrating that we don't have those specifics yet. It's not just Winthrop that doesn't have the specifics. It's the entire state. We believe after a meeting today with the commissioner that the uh, remote model offered by the state will be made known to us this week and we will be able to provide parents with an understanding of what that model would look like should they uh, choose not to uh, send their students to school in the hybrid plan if that is the plan that is chosen by the committee. So in order to assist the committee with the decision-making process, um, our executive director of curriculum and instruction and accountability, Laurie Gallivan is going to um, help walk through some more of these slides. I think it's important that uh, the community as well as the committee understands what evidence we had used for us to recommend this hybrid plan to you. So moving on to the next slide. Um, Laurie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep, yes. Can. Great. Of course, now my screen won't change the next page. There we go. Okay, so we just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what some of the evidence was used in coming to these decisions. So one of the largest was the DESE guidance that was related to facilities and operations. Um, our, our head custodian and all of our custodial staff within the buildings <coughs> worked in concert with the principals and assistant principals and walked every aspect of the building um, 
to make sure that we could in fact put in place all the health and safety procedures for both students and staff in order to be able to bring uh, the hybrid version to reality in the fall. Uh, everything from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the DESI recommendations were considered for the coming school year with the goal of having the students physically present at school. And as Lisa mentioned earlier, um, in accordance with the Board of Health, it was decided that, um, and based on the work with the teachers union as well, that the six foot distancing would stay our recommendation rather than the lesser of the three. In addition to that, uh, there was a full review of the Mass DPH COVID-19 dashboard, which is checked on and regulated, you know, uh, on a daily basis, watching the metrics um, regularly. As of today, again, it was only at 2.2%. Um, the daily review of the COVID-19 confirmed cases in the town of Winthrop, weekly review of the John Hopkins University published COVID-19 testing trends in each state, review of the remote learning studies that was conducted in June of 2020, the return to school family survey sent out in July of 2020 and the staff survey that was done uh, just this past July 2020. So a review of all the data and planning documents related to the evaluations and recommendations um, of the return to school task force and the, their subcommittees. Also a review of multiple communications, emails, website communications tab that we have up and from families and community members who have reached out. How will the hybrid learning work? So there's two aspects that the superintendent was speaking about. In-person days, which represents 50% um, of the student population attending school in person on two consecutive days of the week. And then the remote days, 50% of the student population working remotely three days a week. Also, there will be that option that superintendent just discussed to opt out of the hybrid plan altogether and take advantage of this fully remote plan provided by the state. Uh, we are told, as she said, that we will know more about that hopefully tomorrow um, and over the next couple of days in order to be able to help inform families. How will the hybrid model work? All the students will be divided into the two cohorts, the blue and the gold, as discussed earlier. We'll make every effort to keep siblings together. Uh, schedules will be done based on each individual school for the in-person on Monday, Tuesday, or the Thursday, Friday, with the Wednesday being remote learning for all students. Half of the student population attending school at one time uh, to maintain the classroom social distancing of the six feet model. And the remote learning will be structured and will follow the school schedule. So teachers will provide instruction using a combination of the flipped classroom, Zoom lessons or live streaming of classroom instruction in real time. Uh, in addition, students will be expected to work independently on assignments. It will look differently um, in some aspects than what there was in the spring. Um, and in other aspects, there will be remote pieces that will be similar. Every student under this model will have access to a device. Families will not be expected to share devices between siblings and the district will be offering borrowed devices to those who request them. Uh, the district will also provide more information on the process of borrowing the technology prior to the start of the school year, but all families should know, you know if you have three children and you only have one device at home, we will do everything we can to put a device in each of those children's hands uh, for their remote work. Uh, we were not in a position to do that in the spring uh, during the remote learning um, program, but uh, we are at this time. Uh, there will also be the opportunity for some of our substantially separate special education programs and other identified high needs subgroups of students who will operate four days per week with Wednesday still being the remote learning day. However, specialized services may be provided on Wednesdays as deemed necessary and appropriate um, that would be handled on an you know, individual basis where special education staff would contact parents directly to arrange for any Wednesday services uh, if they were found to be necessary. And in answering the question about how long this hybrid uh, version would last, if the metrics in the state and in Winthrop remain positive and medical science and the future guidance supports it, we'll reevaluate the viability of returning all students to in person school. The first reevaluation date would be Friday, November 13th. Okay. Superintendent Howard. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I think it's critical when we talk about how long this hybrid will last uh, to keep in mind that um, this is a, if this, if we're gonna treat this as a phased in return to school for the purpose of 
all folks becoming comfortable with this new type of educational system uh, that is going to exist across the country. Uh, it is important to be flexible and to understand that things can and, and could likely change on a dime. And that is part of the reason behind the Department of Education's push to have three separate scenarios ready and not have to be caught in the position we were caught in back in March when um, we had to turn on a dime and had to create something while we were in the process of delivering it. So hopefully um, with the work of the committee, the school committee, as well as the return to school task force committee, which will stay in place, we will be able to strategically look at where we are in Winthrop and how things are going within our schools um, and make educated decisions based on data that we will continue to uh, develop as we return to school. So Friday, uh, November 13th is a placeholder. The school committee uh, and I will have further conversation uh, should this be the model um, that they choose to move forward with as to whether or not that date needs to be adjusted uh, and certainly what uh, subsequent dates will be. In order um, to open school in, in the fall, the school committee has approved our school's calendar already uh, for the school year back, I believe in April. Um, there have been some changes from the Department of Education in terms of the total number of required days for students. These changes were brought forward by the department for a number of reasons, um, but one really important reason <coughs> for all of our teachers uh, to come back to this new environment and learn the procedures, the protocols, and the practices that we believe we can uh, put forward to keep all of our students safe. And there are a number of them. Um, this edited version and, and PowerPoint presentation of what a hybrid school um, schedule would look like is definitely not reflective of exactly what it's going to look like. There are uh, the return to school plan that is due to the Department of Education by the 10th of August and made available to families at that same time um, is upwards of 42 pages long and much more detailed in terms of what the school day will look like for your child, uh, what the opt out, uh, opt in or opt out of uh, hybrid learning would look like if you were to choose the remote model. The plan will go over how the school is set up, what the heating systems look like, what has been done to the filter systems, what is our air quality like. It will outline all the protocols. There will be links uh, for families to be able to see what protocols we will use. If there is um, anyone who presents with uh, COVID symptoms or if there is somebody in our school system who is uh, diagnosed with COVID, um, there are uh, multiple, multiple uh, crafted protocols that will have to be followed in order to open school. When the commissioner reduced the total number of student days from 180 to 170, it was with the understanding that those reduced 10 days would be, um, at, would be placed at the beginning of the school year and mandatory for all staff to attend uh, and participate in all the training uh, necessary to open the doors safely for our students. And so for our students, the first day of school, just to give you a snapshot shot, and again, there will be much more detail uh, after uh, this plan is voted and when the final plan is submitted to the community as well as the department on the specifics of every building. However, the first, uh, September 16th would be the first day of school for all students. It, the first three days will look different from how students will go to school after that. Uh, September 16th is a Wednesday, and we felt strongly that we needed to see all of our students on the first day of school and not just the cohort of blue or gold students. So the first three days would be half days in which all students, the students would be split into their cohorts and cohort blue would come in the AM, cleaning would be done uh, upon their dismissal, and in the afternoon cohort B would arrive and we would do that for three days in a row, bringing us to Friday. It'll enable us to work with our students, reintroduce them to school, let them become comfortable um, with just stepping through the door 
uh, and give us an opportunity to work with them to help them understand what it's going to look like now uh, going back to school because it is going to be very different. The social and emotional well-being of our students is, of course, our, our highest priority, um, and it will take some time to orient our students to this new way of learning. On September 21st, which is a Monday, we will begin, um, if accepted, the hybrid model schedule, which will uh, be made known to parents in terms of what uh, cohort your child will be in um, and how that uh, will be split up. So this is an enormous decision for all of us, uh, and all and we have gathered, although we've gathered lots of feedback from families and, and staff and uh, the Department of Ed and the community, we're going to continue to do that between now and the time that we open up schools. In the coming weeks, we're planning to offer uh, an opportunity for more discussion with our families and community members by holding a reopening of schools conversation in which we can give you some more details about the plan and allow uh, for questions to be answered um, to you uh, and, and to be able to really fill the, the families in on how this may look so that you can make an informed decision as to whether you'll select this option or whether or not you will need to uh, request a, uh, a remote option for your child. I am, I believe, uh, just one last note uh, on this. So upon the decision of the school committee, a final reopening of schools plan, as I said before, will be provided to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed. It'll have an in-depth outline of all <coughs> the aspects of teaching and learning in a hybrid model from facilities and operations to health and safety protocols and to the procedures and COVID-19 protocols. I am, I believe I am done with uh, the PowerPoint portion of this and we'll turn it back to the committee. Okay. Um, I'd like to see if we can get a motion um, to adopt the superintendent's school uh, opening, reopening plan, the hybrid plan uh, for discussion purposes. Make so that motion. So Mr. Capovianco has made that motion. Second. Seconded by Ms. Powell. And now any discussion, please through the chair so that we can all, uh, Ms. Powell. Mr. Um, for my first question is if we vote on this tonight, are we, is there an opportunity to, if something changes, if the trajectory of the town changes or if the superintendent feels we need to go in a different direction, can we then revisit this topic? Is that to me? Yes, <laughs> through the chair to you. Yes, I, I, yes, there is. Um, and as COVID has thrown us a curveball every other day, and as uh, information keeps coming our way and, and changing on a daily basis, um, we need to inform the department and the community to the direction that we are taking. However, the school committee um, has the authority to change that direction uh, at any time. What, what the Commissioner has made clear to us is that the plan that we submit to the Department of Education will be reviewed by the Department of Education. And if we were to submit a plan for full in-person learning, we would need in that plan to provide them with the details that would assure them that we have covered every aspect to return 100% of our students to the classroom. Um, if we do the hybrid learning plan, that needs to be outlined as well. He was very clear that if we decided to go remote learning, full remote learning, that the Department of Education would be asking us to justify why we would be fully remote and why we could not implement in-person learning either at some level or at any level. Um, they would ask very specifically for the detail of that. And I believe they have the authority at that point, uh, to let us know that the plan is not acceptable. But I do believe the school committee has the right uh, to change uh, their vote on the plan if they see the need uh, to do so. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Anybody else wish to be heard, Mr. Uh, President Boncori? Yeah, I want to be heard. Uh, Lisa, when is the deadline for giving them our plan? The deadline is the 10th of August. 
and, okay. and that's actually also the date that the department has given us permission to share the plan with the public, the full plan. The full plan, okay. And we're not having another meeting between now and then, obviously. So I suppose we have to um, vote something tonight. I'm a little disappointed. I would like to see the full um, attendance plan, uh, but you guys are the professionals to put this package together. You've done a very well job. Your presentation was very good. So I, I would vote for this plan, but. I was hoping that we would be able to get them back full time. Uh, and and to, your, to your point, Mr. Von Corey, um, I've spoken to a number of school districts, but more importantly on our uh, meetings with the Department of Education and with the commissioner, each school district um, that has, you, you have to have school committee approval of the direction that the school district is taken before you can complete the full plan. Um, so we're a step in toe with what um, all the other districts are doing. We learned today, um, and, and this is through the commissioner and not just a guess, that um, at the present time, because we had to submit something to the commissioner uh, on the 31st, we had to submit our three scenarios and we had to give an indication. Uh, one of the questions was, where, did, where does the school district believe it will be able to land? Um, and 90% of the school districts were uh, hedging towards hybrid learning. He told us today that 10% of those districts either di had not yet made, uh, could make, had, could not yet make uh, an estimation of where they would be landing or they were uh, planning to go fully remote, but not 10% not fully remote. 10% was a combination of leaning towards fully remote or had not yet made a decision. So you're muted. You're on mute, Suzanne. You're, you're on mute. Un you got to unmute yourself, Ms. Wolf. I did. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a question for the superintendent. Yes. Right? Yep. Uh, when we say remote, when we say a flipped classroom, can you explain that uh, a little bit more? Sure. What is a flipped classroom? So I'm going to have Laurie speak to that because she can do it articulately. Hi, everybody. Um, so generally, our goal is that when students come in on Monday and Tuesday, that the kids at home are learning the same things. The goal is not to be repeating what's happening on Monday, Tuesday, when kids come in on Thursday, Friday, right? So we're going to be trying to provide professional development opportunities for our teachers to become better and more skilled at teaching remotely so that they are able to flip it around a little bit. So a flipped classroom generally would be very often they're doing the readings ahead of time. They're doing some preparatory work or some um, forming some hypothesis, depending on what subject matter it is, prior to the direct instruction. Whereas the students that will be in front of the teachers on Monday and Tuesday, for example, would be getting that direct instruction from the teacher and they would be doing some of the legwork, I guess you might call it, for the um, for the standards that are being covered. And then so that the teacher can be hands on with the kids under, you know, to focus on the areas that they believe are most pertinent that they be there for with so, them. So would would the would the teachers be um, videoing that in person classroom to those that are working remotely or not? Yes, so some will be videos, some at the higher levels. Um, I know there's been discussion at the higher levels, primarily at high school too, with doing live streaming. So live streaming their classrooms to the kids at home. Um, so just depends on the different levels because at the younger level, you know, their kids need parental help to be on, be able to get on the computers and be able to watch videos and things. So live streaming might not necessarily be an option if a parent is working from home or something else is going on. But, 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 the, um, but yes, there'll be- the classes there'll be, would be live streamed anyway, right? I mean, you don't have to take advantage of it if you're in a hybrid model and you're going to class on Thursday and Friday, but you could be watching that class. Is, is that what you mean? In some, in some areas, in some levels, there has been discussions with the MTA. Some people are not comfortable with that. Others are very comfortable with it. Um, so that's not something that we've come to any type of agreement on with the MTA, uh, but I do know that there are some that are very comfortable with it. 
that that's what they would choose. Um, <clears throat> it's difficult too because there will be students in those classrooms um, at the same time. So there's only so much that a teacher can control as far as what's said and what's heard via live stream. So there are discussions around that with the MTA and I think the attorneys as well as far as you know what has to be put in place for that that piece. Um, but I think the goal really is is that a Monday and Tuesday when you're in front of your students, you're able to now prepare them for what the work is that they're doing at home um, so that what they find when they log in will make much more sense. It's not so much student directed, it's much more teacher directed and driven um, you know, by their schedule and the amount of time that they have. But there will be videos for them to start off or mini lessons for them to do. And we're, we're also, you know, hoping and, and planning. We don't have all of our numbers in yet, obviously, as far as different staff that are able to return or unable to return, that there will be those that um, possibly aren't able to return that will be monitoring and be there for students who have questions and need assistance throughout the day who are on those remote days. So they won't be just, you know, on their own. On the remote, it will be mostly pre-recorded. Is that right? Would you... At the younger levels, I would say yes. Okay. For the younger students. Thank you. I think someone else had a question to Tino. Mr. Chairman, all set. All right, I just want to first obviously thank Superintendent Howard and Ms. Gallivan and all of our principals for the work they've done on this. In my five years in the school committee, this is by far the most important vote we're ever going to take. Um, I'm coming from a public health area as a member of the Shore Collaborative Board. I had two students and teach, a teacher pass this, this spring, so I'm taking this very seriously. Um, in my research and conversations with school committee members throughout the state, I do think that the hybrid model is the best way to go. However, my question or suggestion rather regarding the opt-out issue, and I know they're doing this as other districts, is I think we should allow opt-out if the parents want to do that, they could do that. That's fine. However, any staff members we have with the pre-existing condition are able to teach those students remotely. So they're still enrolled in our school system. So just to address the enrollment piece, um, the state model that will be offered by the state will have to be managed by the school district okay. and some, and, and not mm -hmm. knowing the details of that state model, not because we're not paying attention, but mm -hmm. because it hasn't become uh, been made known to us as of yet, um, we will have to manage a fair amount of that uh, remote learning system uh, in, in terms of not just the attendance, but the engagement of our kids following through to make sure that they're engaged. The um, chapter 70 money, those students will still be enrolled in the public school. Where students uh, will not be enrolled in the public school will be those students who opt for straight homeschooling where the okay. parent designs the education for those students or uh, create an environment for their student and perhaps some other students. There's lots of conversation um, out there, uh, not just in this community, but in many communities about pods. So parents getting together and hiring a, an educator to work with say, you know, five or six third grade students and teaching them all day that's private education, those students would then be unenrolled from the winter public schools and it would be private and we would not receive chapter 70 money uh, for those students because they would be private. Those same students could not participate uh, in any school-based activities run by the school such as athletics and whatnot. We are waiting for written clarification on the participation of students who opt for the state remote plan. We were to understand today that if students opt out of the hybrid plan, if in fact that is what we offer, and they choose the state's remote plan, we were to understand today that they would also not be eligible for athletics and other school run activities with the mindset or the, the theory um, communicated to us from the Department of Ed today that if, it were, if the parents were not feeling safe enough to have those students participate in in-person learning, it would be um, not, uh, it would not be helpful for them to then participate in activities which those <clears throat> in-person learning students were in attendance at. Um, so I, I hope that clarifies just a little bit. May I ask one more follow up on that? If a family decides to opt out and then, you know, the or 
whatever it may be, and they decide to send their children to school, is is there do we have a system in place to accommodate that, like a two week wait period or? Yeah, we do. So we've been, um, you know, obviously not having the parameters of the of the state program in place is, is holding us back a, li a little bit. Um, however, uh, the state is very clear that parents can opt in and opt out, but that the school district, it would behoove the school district to have timelines associated with that. For instance, uh, if you opt out, you would have a timeline that you would have an opt back in option. Uh, and typically that would be at the end of a semester or a break um, in the in the academics so that we make sure that the students are returning to us at a time where they won't be lost in, in the world of education and that they'll be able to transition smoothly. So we have not uh, we have not come up with that date as of yet. We have a few more meetings uh, this week and hopefully we'll have that guidance in our hands. So those are some of the last minute uh, preparation things that uh, we have to nail down before we can offer it to parents. It's, it's very frustrating to let parents know that there's gonna be an opt out option because the department has told us that, but we don't know what they're telling them to opt out. So to ask them now, if they're gonna choose hybrid or the opt out plan um, is not beneficial because we don't have anything to tell them about what they're opting into. Hopefully we'll have that information this week and, and after the committee votes, we can at least give them a clear, parents a clear picture of what their choice is. Thank you. Ms. Swope. Mr. Chairman. Um, Lisa, um, is I thought we had voted before that if a parent chooses to homeschool their children, that they could participate in athletics. I didn't know. I don't know. If Correct. We had... So, so we clarified. We had a policy subcommittee meeting prior to uh, COVID, I believe, yeah, uh, right. being an issue, um, and so that you are correct, and we clarified that for students who are homeschooled. Right. Uh, in, in, in order to uh, ensure equity across all parameters of how we're providing education, I would imagine the policy subcommittee would have to revisit that just for the purpose of the equity uh, and decide whether or not they wanted to continue with that practice uh, or not. And, and base it on um, the, the COVID parameters right now, which is not what we based our last decision on. Thank you. Lisa, I just wanna add and, and we can double check this, but I'm fairly certain that the commissioner today said that they may be putting a blanket in that that homeschool or remote. Any kid who's not participating in hybrid would not be allowed to participate because they would then again be exposing kids to a different cohort that they would not have been exposed to. So I think they may be making that decision for everybody during this time period. And we can get clarification on that. But to, to Suzanne's point, we we did make we did right. change that policy to reflect that so that may be confusing for parents so once right. uh, once we have that directive from the state um, that we probably wouldn't have to change the policy because the state's directive would supersede the policy i think chairman yes mr Matucci. i just um need to commend lisa and her staff for doing this is uh unprecedented um it's a lot of work a lot of time and uh She's done a great job, uh, her and her staff. So uh, I too, like Phil, I'm in favor of going back 100%. However, with uh, all this information that's so fluid coming out and, um, you know, uh, federal, state, local, and, and doctors and experts, and of course, I have complete trust and confidence in our superintendent and her staff, I would be in favor of the hybrid model. Um, my only question would be is on the November 13th evaluation. If um, at that time there's no spike, there's no cases, uh, nothing's changed, everything's the same or, or, or better, when would we be going back full time? Lisa? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, so wait till you... I think we do need some more clarity on the state whether or not they require another approval. And, and that question has not come up yet. I think folks are just now beginning to, we've looked at this as a phase in return to school from day one. Um, and I think some other schools have, but it has not come up in any of our question and answers with the commissioner as to uh, how quickly we could uh, turn back I, in, into a, a more in-person learning. I think everything he has said up to this point, there are many parameters of this that are local decision-making authority and I think if the school district uh, 
had enough data to support that students were uh, learning well and that we had more room um, and that we had a lot of folks that were, you know, uh, opting for remote learning privately. I believe we can continue to bring individual students back, but to turn the whole plan um, into a full person, I will get clarity on that from the commissioner um, and can get back to you on that. I don't, if, if, if we were to do it, we would need to give our parents obviously notice and uh, we'd need to share the data behind the decision making with the folks as, as we're doing in, in this type of forum. Uh, but I can get some more information on that. I just don't know the actual true answer to that. But the November 13th date is when they're going to reevaluate. On November 13th, I'd like to, the plan would be to come back to the committee um, with a report as to how things are going, what it's looking like, have the Board of Health, have a pre-meeting with the Board of Health to look at the metrics of the community of Winthrop um, and also much prior to that, have information from the commissioner as to um, what we would need to do in order to, to change the course of action. Mr. Boncori. Yeah, and unfortunately part of this is that we did get four new cases of COVID testing positive in Winthrop today. So, I mean, we're not over the COVID pandemic and, that, and that's part of the reason I, I didn't go along with this. But there has to be some benchmark set by the state or by us at some point when it's at this level or it's at this level or we can go to four and a half feet between the three and the six feet. Can we go full time? And that has to be said by the state, doesn't it? Or can we set that? So we, we uh, learned again today and the slow drip of information became, becomes very overwhelming. Uh, but we learned that that has been a, a a concern the metrics of decision making about returning to school fully um, what are the numbers um, an awful lot of questions have been landing in the laps of educators that have absolutely nothing to do with education and that's very scary and it's scary um, you know personally it's concerning to, to make some of those decisions so it has been a charge of i believe um, the mta as well as the Superintendents Association to have the state of Massachusetts develop those metrics and make them consistent across uh, all schools for, for equity and for solid understanding of who's making the call about medical decisions. You know, what constitutes uh, an appropriate number of COVID cases in a community? Now, of course, every community is different. My guess is that the state would have some sort of a metrics that would take a look at your individual community uh, and where you were and how you've been progressing and where you currently are. Uh, our Board of Health and Meredith Hurley provide me with that data every single day. Um, however, the decision-making of what's the threshold, we strongly believe is a decision that needs to come from the state. And we anticipate that that will be coming, which would be helpful for the association, for the parents, and certainly for the school department in terms of making health and, and well-being. But Lisa, I, I think by that November 13th date, the state should have some guidelines and some idea of where we're headed based upon the entire state and, and what, what's occurring at that time. So I think it gives us a, a really good jump off point to come up with where we're gonna be um, and when we could actually return to a, a you know, full status. I agree. Any uh, further discussion? Yeah. Paul? Uh, just one more. All right, through the chair. This is our can you um, tell us a little bit about how the staff is responding to this? And are you concerned about staffing in the fall if we do? Sure. 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 Well, I've had two um, meetings, very large Zoom meetings with our staff, um, and they have been amazing um, in terms of showing up to the meetings. Certainly, like every other person in our community, parents, students, uh, superintendents, um, there's unrest and, and people are nervous and, and we're nervous because we don't know what we're, um, what the final plan is yet. And that's not because Winthrop is dragging its feet by any means. Every single school district is in the same, um, same spot. We are responding to the Department of Education and their guidance. And um, there is a timeline, there is an end because they want school to be open and they have told us it has to be open. The information sharing and the guidelines, guidance and, and support we're receiving um, is, is coming out in slow dribs and drabs, which prevents us from making some decisions. So uh, in terms of our, our staff, they have been amazing, um, amazingly open to discussion 
hearing uh, where we're at. I've been providing, as I have the school committee, a continual flow of updates as I can. Um, not giving you erroneous information or hopeful information, but just letting you know where we're at and, and what we know and, and leaving out uh, the need for people to make assumptions. I had a meeting with them today. Um, I believe uh, there were 156 members of our school community on the Zoom call. They had lots of great questions. Um, many of them are concerned. We have uh, staff members who have pre-existing conditions. We have staff members who have family members that live with them that are elderly. Um, that have children who have conditions, uh, medical conditions. And so in terms of answering how many people will be coming back, we did poll uh, our staff with a survey in late June. Uh, and at that time, um, it, it looked pretty good. Um, I think the more the media provides information to the community and depending upon what channel you're watching will depend upon uh, the information that you get. And I think people have questions every day whether or not it's safe. Our goal in building this plan and continuing to communicate with them was to um, build their confidence. And I think a reopening plan that's phased in will continue to build the confidence of our staff that we are supporting them, that we do care about their health. Um, when kids go to school, you don't just open a door um, and let them in and say good luck. We have adults in there that need to supervise them. And all the conversation about the slow transmission uh, from younger children. Don't forget, younger children are in front of staff members. Um, so we anticipate uh, about 17, <coughs> 17 to a high of uh, potentially 30% of our staff may not be able to return. We have um, using money through uh, COVID relief funds and not school department budget funds. We have uh, onboarded a HR firm from the city of Boston who, spe who specializes in family medical leave uh, and uh, leave of absences to any one of the requests from our teachers and be able to vet it out in a professional manner that allows for confidentiality of our staff, but also allows them an answer um, that is a, a real answer from a perspective of folks who have legal advisory to be able to let folks know uh, what their options are and what they are able to do or not to do. So I'm um, long answer to that uh, short question. I anticipate 17 to a high of 30% of our staff um, potentially not being able to return to their job in the fall. Well, that's fair. Uh, Lisa, I have two questions. One is, did, on that second survey that you sent out, what were the, was there a percentage of students that, that said to you that they were thinking of, of um, going remote or not coming back or? It was, and I knew you would ask me that, and I do have the information, but it's going to take me a second to pull it out, so if you could just go to question number two, and I'll look that up. <laughs> okay. Um, if indeed, God forbid, we should have a spike upward, would that the state do the same thing in terms of the spike upward as well as downward? They're going to give us some guidance about what to do? They are, and, and as the governor has the ability to do uh, as he did on the 16th of March, the governor can shut schools down uh, at any point in time that he feels that it's necessary. Again, sharing the three the three plans with the Department of Education um, is their reason to make sure that folks can uh, can turn immediately when they need to uh, back to fully um, fully remote. And in terms of the survey, given I have hundreds of pieces of paper in front of me. I can get back to you on that. It is posted on our school's website, the parent survey. So if you go, oh, to, the return, I, I, yeah, if you go to the return to school page, okay. uh, my luck, if I try to do that while I'm talking to you, That's I will um, I'll look it up and zoom everybody back into their living rooms alone. Okay, thank you, you. You can look if right on the website for that. Another discussion before we go to vote? Hearing none. Uh, Ms. Hames, could you uh, call the uh, roll? Oh, actually, do we have yeah, a mo motion? Motion to accept the hybrid. Actually, we already actually we already have a, a, motion. On the table. a motion. The motion on. We do Ms. have Hames, a motion on the to table. To accept the uh, return to school recommendation plan of the superintendent. It's already been uh, a motion and a second. So, if there's no further discussion, I'll call the vote. Ms. Uh, Hames, could you please call the roll for the record? Yes, Ms. Barry. Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. 
Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Okay, moving on, the revised school calendar. Uh, Ms. Howard, do you uh, want to discuss that? I think you already touched on it. I, I touched on it. What I would like to do is um, we are looking at, um, we have it pretty much done. Our goal is to any type of, we're moving around any prior scheduled um, professional development that would lead us to need to the need for a half a day for our students, which is on the last calendar you voted. We are moving those professional development days to Wednesdays, which is a remote learning day for all students to lessen the impact of, um, of a half day schedule. So they will already be at home. Um, we don't wanna have a half day schedule on any day that the students would have been in-person learning. I will have that calendar um, fully outlined for you in terms of the days, but the start date of school would be uh, for students to be 16th and teachers would be returning on the original start date of the 31st because those 10 days, uh, they're still gonna be in attendance um, here at school doing that professional development. So I wanted, just, I wanted it to be on your radar and that is why I put it under new business and I'll have a fully redone schedule uh, for the committee to take a vote on at the next meeting. Motion to the table. Second. Uh, I don't think we need to uh, table, uh, make a motion. No. It's actually okay. we a vote on it yet. It hasn't been our motion yet. So I think we'll just move the, move on to uh, unfinished business, which we've also uh, tackled through our uh, subcommittee uh, meeting for uh, policy. And I think we're now at uh, public comment again. Ms. Howard, do we have any additional uh, emails that have come in for public comment for Ms. Uh, Hames to read? Yes, so just for some clarity on public comment, I've received during this meeting uh, to my left, I have a screen up that is um, feeding me my emails as they come in. And on, um, on those, there are a few emails asking me questions directly, but not, not public comment. I have forwarded Patty Hames two um, that have come in as public comment in the, um, in the subject line. And I just received, um, one more. So Patty, if you want to start with those two while I try to pull these other ones down as we're speaking. Okay, so um, you said Connie Grayson wants me to read hers as well? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, Connie Grayson sent this in on August 2nd. Yeah. I am writing this letter on behalf of the 56% of teachers who believe it is unsafe to return to school this fall. The MTA made a statement that supporting remote learning is the safest choice for teachers and students. This decision was based upon the recent research regarding COVID-19. I fully support the MTA's decision to continue with remote learning. As much as I hope to return to the classroom, I believe it is not in the safest interest of the teachers or students. There are many teachers, including myself, who are compromised, or there are some teachers who take care of a loved one who may also be compromised. By going back to school, these teachers would be risking their lives and the lives of their loved ones on a daily basis. It is also, it also is not in the best interest for those students who may be struggling with mental health issues. The way we would be returning would be mentally scarring and uncomfortable for those who already struggle with anxiety. My flexible classroom is no longer present. My classroom, which once held a couch, rug, private learning caves, standing station, group work tables, and a teaching table has been replaced by 24 desks all in a row, three feet away from each other. Learning environments do have a direct impact on student achievement. My library area is no longer, all books have now been stored away. Students will no longer be able to share or work in groups. Our days of singing during brain breaks will be gone because no singing will be allowed. Lunch will be at the student's desk and students will not be allowed to go to specials. If COVID-19 continued to spread and it came down to the school closure, school closure, the inconsistency could also be harmful to a student's mental health. I truly believe it is the best, it is in the best interest of students, teachers, and families to continue with remote learning. And that was um, sent in by Connie Grayson. And then we have more that came in um, this evening. So while you're looking at those, Patty, I just sent I sent you two 
and I had um, one parent that I can just read. It's a short one that asked um, asked me a a question. It's not necessarily a public comment, um, but it is a question. And and the question was uh, why we uh, why we did not pick a one week on and a one week off model as part of the hybrid model schedule. And I'm answering the question because I may have been remiss in not um, explaining that. So the one week on and one week off model um, would mean that a group of students, say A through uh, A through L, would come one week, and the other and the other end of the alphabet would stay home and learn remotely that entire week. And then the following week, the group that was home remote would spend a whole week of in-person learning. And our teams looked at that uh, quite extensively. Uh, certainly by grade and age uh, was a big consideration. And the general consensus uh, was that students not being present in front of teachers for that many days, uh, especially if there was a holiday on a Monday, could it potentially leave students uh, out, of school, out of school or out of the presence of a teacher or their peers for upwards of nine days. Uh, and the team felt as though that uh, nine days of, of no interaction with teachers uh, or other uh, schoolmates um, would be uh, detrimental to our students, and um, that is why we did not chose that model. And okay. so I think we have one from uh, public comment from Cindy Silva, Patty. Yep, and I had other ones from before. Oh, okay, sorry. Can we start from the beginning there? Yes, please. Okay, so um, this is public comment. Uh, dear Winthrop School Committee, as president of the senior class and student council executive board, I would like to share my feelings about returning to school in the fall. From the perspective of a student, my current preference is to return to school full time, if at all possible, this fall. While I understand the position of many, many parents and teachers, I implore you to consider the student's point of view. Our teachers did an admirable job last spring, but it was nowhere near the same as the education we, that we received when we were in the building. We need to interact with our teachers and with one another. Students with learning challenges and disabilities are particularly at risk by not being in the building. We understand that safety protocols are necessary and especially in the high school, we are more than capable of following them. If it is essential that we learn, then it is essential that we do it in person full time. Thank you, Jenna Dorr, class president, class of 2021. Okay, this is the next one. Dear Ms. Howard, my wife and I have a son starting preschool in the fall. We are in support of a reopening fully while taking the, the proper precautions. Other districts are able to achieve distance learning through a variety of methods, and I believe with proper research, we can do the same. Also, I would like to emphasize the, important, the importance of age when thinking about distance learning. Small children struggle with remote learning. Please open the schools in the fall. Robert Morfino and Sarah Jane Forness. Uh, this one came in this evening as well. It concerns me that the guidelines for students as it pertains to social distancing are less than the requirements for business construction and offices. We are our own worst enemies. <coughs> it is our nature to get physically close to those we have a close relationship with, even though they are not in our household. I have personally seen that wearing masks in the workplace Remaining six feet apart and increased hygiene practice does not prevent 100% of infections. I hope the committee stands by its recommendation to err on the side of caution with any recommendation and keep the six foot social distancing requirement. Thank you, Dan Internicola. Uh, and then this is the, the last one we have this evening. Uh, dear Mrs. Howard, while our preference would be for students to return full time this fall, we can understand the reasons why a phased approach beginning with a hybrid model, model may be optimal. Thank you for your thoughtful approach to this matter. That said, we hope the decision to divide the students, particularly, particularly at the high school level, will be done thoughtfully and not simply be done by dividing the alphabet. While this approach is certainly the simplest, we believe this doesn't consider the emotional, social, and psychological needs of the students. After seeing the level of disruption and emotional distress, the move to remote learning caused the class of 2020, we think we need to do everything possible to try to keep grades together at the high school level. It also would be helpful to involve some of your student leaders and not just the school community and parents in your discussions. 
if you need parent volunteers, please let us know. Thank you for your consideration, uh, Cindy and Jay Silva. And I have, I have one more, Patty, if you're done. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so I had one more um, from Geneva Faber. And her comment was, what are the sports and extracurricular activities next year? And will there be outside tent models available? So we didn't speak to sports during the meeting, but um, September, um, so sports right now through MIAA are on hold through September 14th. I do believe there's additional information coming out um, or may have already come out this week that I have yet to have the uh, time or opportunity to pay attention to. Uh, our athletic director will keep me updated and I will get that information out to parents as soon as possible. And in terms of uh, outside seating, we didn't discuss outside seating or options, but it is something that um, is in the full plan that we are gonna consider the use of as much outside space as humanly possible. Um, and and that, it, that allows, and the tents, we have looked into purchasing or renting of tents for coverage. Um, and as of right now, the availability is zero. I am working with uh, some folks from Newton Public Schools uh, at this time who may have some intel as to uh, rental companies that uh, may be available uh, if in fact we are um, find the need to have those uh, tents outside. Um, and also one more comment that came from uh, Diana Baines and she would like me to uh, read a comment that says, understanding you may not have received much information with respect to the state's remote learning program. Are you able to answer any of the following questions at this point? Will the state program include synchronous learning? How about assigned teacher, an assigned teacher teaching live? What programs are being considered by the state for managing the full remote option? And um, we do not have the answers to either of those uh, questions as of yet. And we are hoping to have those answers this week when the state provides us uh, with an, a description of the model uh, and a description of the company uh, that they have chosen. They received uh, they put out an RFP for um, remote learning platforms and they received several and they are making those decisions at, at that level. And other folks have um, just one other point of clarity around space and tenting. Um, folks have asked if we've explored utilizing other school buildings or like the old middle school or St. John's school um, for space. Um, and at this point in time, as I stated at the beginning, the physical plant, we are a fortunate community that the physical plant that we have is able to support the needs of our students uh, as a whole. We do not, we do not need additional space uh, at this time because with the matrix from the state and the social distancing um, requirements, bringing all of our students back in fully is, is not a consideration at this time. So in, in each one of those buildings, the two buildings that uh, are known to us um, have been explored in the past for use. Uh, and there have been multiple reasons why students are not in those buildings now. Uh, and to put them back in there, they would have to be a heavy need and we don't have that need as of right now. We'd also have to have the staff to uh, go into those buildings if, if we were to put students in there, but we have not determined if there's a need to do that. Any further that public I have. Okay, uh, public comment, uh, seeing no further. Uh, emails, moving on to, to uh, public relations. Ms. Swope, do you have anything this evening? No, sir. Uh, Julie, Barry? No. President Boncori? You're on mute, but I must say no. Mr. Capabianco? No. Uh, Mr. Matucci? All set, sir. Uh, Ms. Powell? I want to thank the organizers and staff administration for putting on a wonderful graduation. I know that there was a lot of effort, a great deal of planning and angst, particularly when the original date, the original reschedule date was rained out, but the event was phenomenal and our seniors were very much appreciated as, as are the parents. That was an extra effort uh, on a part of the Really great job, Lisa, to uh, everyone that participated. I also want to thank uh, you, you and your leadership team uh, and teachers for the hard work in drafting this return plan 
uh, and getting ready to implement it and get our kids back uh, into the schools as much as we possibly can. Uh, can I get a motion for adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, roll call. Roll call. <laughs> Ms. Barry? Yes. Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night.